Hello, and welcome to Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I'll be your geographer today and your reader. One of the things that I'm hearing everywhere, all over town, friends far and wide, foreign countries everywhere, is everybody's talking about needing a vacation. And God knows, after the past year that we've had of house arrest, that seems to continue even today, uh, we all need a vacation. So I think if we each close our eyes, there's probably some spot on the planet Earth that you can just sort of dream yourself into. And you might remember that old line, beam me up, Scotty. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Scotty could just beam me up and take me to the little place that I'd really like to go to and get out of Dodge for a while. My place is in the south of France. And it's a little town just east of Marseille called Cassis. And if you've never been there, I advise you to close your eyes and transport yourself as William Shakespeare said, let your imaginary forces work. Today we're going to one of those fabulous places. We're going to take you there in the month of April for the enchanted April. Many of you may be familiar with this book. It's also been made into a film. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Written by Elizabeth Van Arnen, uh, Von Arnen uh, in 1921 and published in uh, 1922. And a new copyright added to the recent uh, edition uh, in 2007. Uh, so it's uh, an absolutely delightful book. I enjoyed every page of it. Uh, and that's where we're going to take you today. We're going to start, though, in London, where all of this uh, story begins. Uh, I will tell you that the film, if you've not seen it, uh, does have some pretty fabulous stars in it, uh, including Joan Plowright, who, of course, you may know, was the wife of Laurence Olivier. Uh, so it does have Joan Plowright. It also has... Um, uh, Alfred Molina, uh, there are men in this story as well, uh, not as many men as there are women, but uh, Miranda Richardson, the wonderful Miranda Richardson is one of the stars, but Joan Plowright plays the very proper English lady um, who is just wanting to take over and be in charge. Who else was in it? Josie Lawrence, Polly Walker, uh, Alfred Molina was in it, Michael Kitchen, uh, Jim Broadbent, uh, one of the husbands. Um, so it's a wonderful film, it came out in 1991. So if you enjoy what we talk about today, then uh, dive in and see the film. Let's start in London. Uh, we're going to go though, 875 miles, 875 miles. Uh, uh, the drearier statistic there is though, 21 hours on Eurostar. So 21 hours from uh, London on Eurostar is going to put us smack dab in the absolutely gorgeous, enchanting little peninsula, the end of the peninsula in Portofino, Portofino, Italy. Portofino is about an hour from Genoa. Genoa plays a part in, in the early part of the book here. Uh, and it's right at the top of the boot. Uh, if you haven't studied that uh, Italian geography for a while, right at the top of the boot on the west side, on the west side of the boot, right at the top, uh, if you uh, turned left, so to speak, you would end up crossing the border into Nice. So it's very close to the Nice border, but it is a beautiful city. Let me sell you on it for starters here. Let me read to you uh, a little uh, PR from Portofino that I found. Portofino, I should say it with as much appeal as possible. Portofino is an Italian fishing village and a holiday resort famous for its picturesque harbor and historical association with celebrity and artistic visitors. It is a commune located in the metropolitan city of Genoa on the Italian Riviera. The town is clustered around the small harbor and is known for the colorfully painted buildings that line the shore. And as I look even at photos from Wikipedia, at this very second, so that I'm inspired, the town along the water uh, at the front of the hills, uh, every building is a different pastel color. So you've got the blues and the pinks and the yellows and the greens and the purples and uh, 
Absolutely, absolutely spectacular. So I probably sold you enough. All of you want to go on a vacation, I feel sure. So uh, let's start getting there. Let's start to get there. What happens? How do we start here? Uh, we start in London and a very, very dreary London. Uh, I think uh, that Elizabeth uh, decided that the drearier she painted London, the more spectacular it would be when we get to Portofino. And it starts with two strangers uh, sitting in their private club, a, a woman's club on Shaftesbury Avenue, a lower Shaftesbury Avenue uh, in London. Uh, and uh, they are strangers. They are about the same age in the early 30s. Uh, and they're both reading the, the London Times. All right, so far so good, pretty simple. It's coincidental though, that they're both reading the same advertisement in the London Times. Uh, and they discover that only after a bit of daydreaming about what the advertisement says. Here is the advertisement from the London Times. To those who appreciate wisteria and sunshine, small medieval Italian castle, on the shores of the Mediterranean to be let furnished for the month of April. Necessary servants remain. Z, box 1000, the times. Well, in the middle of rainy London, in the middle of March, uh, how attractive would that be to you? It would certainly be attractive to me. Well, as the first chapter rolls on, the two women do happen to meet simply in passing the newspaper back onto the desk and one notices what the other one is looking at, long story short. They convince each other that they should pursue this. Um, and one of them more so than the other, she's kind of the, the life energy of the whole project. Um, and then they discover, you know, um, it sleeps eight. So if we had a couple more women or a few more women, it could be a, a women's holiday in the, in the beautiful uh, Italian Riviera. So they put an advertisement in the newspaper and they track down uh, two other people. Only two more respond. And one of the ladies says, well, we only need to, so let's go interview them. So they do interview other ladies, one of them, uh, the Joan Plowright character, the very proper older lady in the, in the combination here, uh, asks for references. <laughs> That's a bit putting off and they get over that in a hurry. But they are eventually, the four of them, uh, out of rainy London, cold, rainy London, I'm trying to paint that scene for you, obviously as dreary as possible. They uh, decide to head for San Salvadore, San Salvadore. And the owner of San Salvadore is a young man in his late 20s who's inherited the castle from his uh, father, who passed away recently. Uh, they haven't met him, of course. They've only responded to the ad. Um, so the four of them are now together. Let's meet them, just so I'm going to dive into the first third of the book rather than the beginning. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Uh, here is what uh, the jacket cover of the book says. The women at the center of the enchanted April are alike only in their dissatisfaction with their everyday lives. Ah, there's the common denominator other than the fact that they're also women and they would like to get out of Dodge. The ladies expect a pleasant holiday, but they don't anticipate that the month they spend in Portofino will reintroduce them to their true natures and reacquaint them with joy. That's what makes the book so fabulous. So the characters, not to give you a, a whole roll call here, but we're gonna meet the four ladies, just so as I read about them, you'll have a picture in your mind. Mrs. Lottie Wilkins, she begins the beginning. She's the first to read the ad. She's the energy person. She's the one who says things like, I see us there, <laughs> in an effort to try to convince the other lady there in the ladies club. Uh, she has a husband, uh, Malersh, who's a very, very boring, handsome, she says, but boring solicitor. 
overworked, underpaid, uh, etc. She doesn't get much chance to see him. Uh, so she just jumps at this idea. And the person she convinces to go with her for starters is Mrs. Rose Arbuthnot. Very strange word, A-R-B-U-T-H-N-O-T, Arbuthnot. Uh, she too is in her mid thirties. She's married to Frederick. He's also Ferdinand, Ferdinand Arundel. That's his nom de plume because he writes memoirs of the mistresses of kings. <laughs> once a year, very popular. Uh, so uh, these are the two ladies that begin our story. We should tell you that Rose is a, is a volunteer, doesn't get to see her husband very much either. Uh, she's a volunteer, mostly at church. Uh, and she has a problem with the fact that the money that runs the household comes from writing about mistresses of kings. So that bothers her a bit. Uh, but anyway, those are the two ladies that begin to begin. And then we add two more to that, Lady Carolyn Dester. And I think it would be Caroline, just because she's so English. Uh, 28, uh, she is an exceptionally beautiful and desperately tired of bewitched men she refers to as grabbers. <laughs> Now, most of us would love to be grabbed at, I suppose, if we were gorgeous and beautiful. She's just very, very, very tired of it. Comes from a very rich um, aristocratic family, uh, the Druth witches, which we don't hear too much about. But anyway, she's going on this holiday just to get away from men. So there we go. And we add Joan Plowright to this uh, soup, Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Fisher never seems to have a first name. Uh, so very formally, we call her Mrs. Fisher throughout the book. Very respectable, very proper. A widow with a walking stick, um, uh, very rich and has memories of the past. She rather lives more in the past than in the present. And her family friends included Tennyson and Carlyle and Keats and Matthew Arnold and Meredith. So she's always trying to bring that subject up or in any way that she can. And she's the proper grand dame of our arrival in San Salvatore. Two things I want to add before we begin. Uh, one is a word. I just want to make sure we all know that word from 1921, 22. We don't use it at all now, I don't think. And the word is fly. Well, in Maine, we have black flies as the state bird. Uh, but a uh, fly uh, was a single horse pleasure carriage. Now, the word fly also refers to the fact that it moves rather quickly. So this comes into play when we pick the first two ladies up at the station. And that's in one of the two chapters I'm going to read to you today. So I just wanted to make sure that you uh, remembered that word or learned that word. And I have to add an apology because I'm not much of a horticulturist. And when we get to Portofino in April, everything is in bloom. They're there for a month and every week something new blooms. Now I've looked up several words for pronunciation, but I'm sure to mess up a few. So all you uh, uh, horticulturists out there who are ready to plant your gardens for the summer, please forgive me for uh, butchering some of the words. So let us begin. I think we've got a good idea. We're starting in rainy London. Where we're going to start uh, is chapter five. We're going to do chapter five and chapter six. Uh, chapter five is the arrival, uh, which has had some problems, some trouble, uh, not only the weather, unfortunately, even as far as Genoa, it's raining, not a good start to a vacation, uh, but a few other technical things with luggage and we're getting to the station and et cetera, et cetera. And remember the two ladies are, um, are still strangers. And then we'll go to that first day of being there in the sunshine in Portofino. Um, and I think you'll get a great taste. You'll want to go immediately. I did read somewhere and was something I was looking at about Portofino that uh, the tourist trade in Portofino uh, increased dramatically and has stayed uh, dramatically high for years and years after the publishing of this book. So after the film in 1991. All right, here we go. Chapter five, it was cloudy in Italy, which surprised them. They had expected brilliant sunshine, but never mind. it was Italy and the very clouds looked fat. 
Neither of them have ever been there before. Only the first two ladies are arriving. I may have said that, but I want to make that clear. Both gazed out of the windows with rapt faces. The hours flew as long as it was daylight. And after that, there was the excitement of getting nearer, getting quite near, getting there. At Genoa, it had begun to rain. Genoa, imagine actually being at Genoa, seeing its name written up on the station, just like any other name. At Nervi, it was pouring. And when at last towards midnight, for again, the train was late, they got to Mezzago. The rain was coming down in what seemed solid sheets, but it was Italy. Nothing it did could be bad. The very rain was different. Straight rain falling properly on one's umbrella. Not that violently blowing English stuff that got in everywhere. And it did leave off, and when it did, behold, the earth would be strewn with roses. Mr. Briggs, San Salvatore's owner, had said, you get out at Mezzago and then you drive. But he had forgotten what he amply knew, that trains in Italy are sometimes late. And he had imagined his tenants arriving at Mezzago at eight o'clock and finding a string of flies to choose from. The train was four hours late, and when Mrs. Arbuthnot and Mrs. Wilkins scrambled down the ladder-like steps of their carriage into the black downpour, their skirts sweeping off great pools of sooty wet because their hands were full of suitcases, it had not, if it had not been for the vigilance of Domenico, the gardener at San Salvatore, they would have found nothing for them to drive in. All ordinary flies had long since gone home. Domenico, foreseeing this, had sent his aunt's fly, driven by her son, his cousin, and his aunt and her fly lived in Castagneto, the village crouching at the feet of San Salvatore. And therefore, however the late the train was, the fly would not dare come home without containing that which had been sent to fetch. Domenico's cousin's name was Beppo, and he presently emerged out of the dark where Mrs. Arbuthnot and Mrs. Wilkins stood, uncertain what to do next after the train had gone on, for they could see no porter, and they thought from the feel of it that they were standing not so much on a platform as in the middle of the permanent way. Beppo, who had been searching for them, emerged from the dark with a kind of pounce and talked Italian to them vociferously. Beppo was a most respectable young man and he did not look as if he were, especially not in the dark, and he had a dripping hat slouched over one eye they did not like the way he seized their suitcases. He could not be, they thought, a porter. However, they presently, from out of this streaming talk, discerned the words San Salvatore. And after that, they kept on saying them to him, for it was the only Italian they knew as they hurried after him, unwilling to lose sight of their suitcases stumbling across rails and through puddles out to where in the road a small high fly stood. Its hood was up and its horse was in an attitude of thought. They climbed in and the minute they were in, Mrs. Wilkins indeed could hardly be called in, the horse awoke with a start from its reverie and immediately began going home rapidly without Beppo, without the suitcases. Beppo darted after him, making the night ring with his shouts and caught the hanging reins just in time. He explained proudly, and as it seemed to him with perfect clearness, that their horse always did that, being a fine animal full of corn and blood and cared for by him, Beppo, as if he were his own son, and the ladies must not be alarmed. He had noticed they were clutching each other, but clear and loud and profuse of word though he was, 
they only looked at him blankly. He went on talking, however, while he piled the suitcases up round them, sure that sooner or later they must understand him, especially he was careful to talk very loud and illustrate everything he said with the simplest elucidatory gestures, but they both continued only to look at him. They both, he noticed sympathetically, had white faces, fatigued faces, and they both had big eyes, fatigued eyes. They were beautiful ladies, he thought, and their eyes, looking at him over the tops of the suitcases, watching his every movement, there were no trunks, only numbers of suitcases, were like the eyes of the mother of God. The only thing the lady said, and they appeared, they repeated it at a regular interview intervals, even after they had started, gently prodding him as he sat on his box to call attention to it was, San Salvatore. <laughs> and each time he answered vociferously, encouragingly, si, 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 San Salvatore. We don't know, of course, if he's taking us there, said Mrs. Arbuthnot at last in a low voice, after they had been driving, as it seemed to them, a long while, and then got off the paving stones of the sleep-shrouded town and were out on a winding road with what they could just see was a low wall on their left, beyond which was a great black emptiness and the sound of the sea. On their right was something close and steep and high and black. Rock, they whispered to each other. Huge rocks. No, we don't know, agreed Mrs. Wilkins, a slight coldness passing down her spine. They felt very uncomfortable. It was so late. It was so dark. The road was so lonely. Suppose a wheel came off. Suppose they met fascisti, or the opposite of fascisti. How sorry they were now that they had not slept at Genoa and come on the next morning in daylight. But that would have been the first of April, said Mrs. Wilkins in a low voice. It is that now, said Mrs. Arbuthnot beneath her breath. So it is, murmured Mrs. Wilkins. They were silent. Beppo turned round on his box, a disquieting habit already noticed, for surely his horse ought to be carefully watched, and again addressed them what, what he was convinced was lucidity. No patois and the clearest explanatory movements. How much they wished their mothers had made them learn Italian when they were little. If only now they could have said, Please sit round the right way and look after the horse. They did not even know what horse was in Italian. It was contemptible to be so ignorant. In their anxiety, for the road twisted round, great jutting rocks, and on their left was only the low wall to keep them out of the sea should anything happen, they too began to gesticulate, waving their hands at Beppo, pointing ahead. They wanted him to turn round again and face his horse, that was all. He thought they wanted him to drive faster, and there followed a terrifying ten minutes, during which, as he supposed, he was gratifying them. He was proud of his horse, and it could go very fast. He rose in his seat. The whip cracked. The horse rushed forward. The rocks leaped towards them. The little fly swayed. The suitcases heaved. Mrs. Arbuthnot and Mrs. Wilkins clung until at a point near Castagneto, there was a rise in the road, and on reaching the front of the rise, the horse, who knew every inch of the way, stopped suddenly, throwing everything in the fly into a heap, and then proceeded up at the slowest of walks. Beppo twisted himself round to receive their admiration, laughing with pride at his horse. There was no answering laugh from the beautiful ladies. Their eyes fixed on him seemed bigger than ever and their faces against the black of the night showed milky. But here at last, once they were up the slope were houses. The rocks left off and there were houses. The low wall left off and there were houses. 
the sea shrunk away and the sound of it ceased and the loneliness of the road was finished. No lights anywhere, of course, nobody to see them pass. And yet Beppo, when the houses began, after looking over his shoulder and shouting Castagneto at the ladies, once more stood up and cracked his whip and once more made his horse dash forward. We shall be there in a minute, Mrs. Arbuthnot said to herself, holding on. We shall soon stop now, Mrs. Wilkins said to herself, holding on. They said nothing aloud because nothing would have been heard above the whip cracking and the wheel clattering and the boisterous inciting noises Beppo was making at his horse. Anxiously, they strained their eyes for any sight of the beginning of San Salvatore. They had supposed and hoped that after a reason about a village, a medieval archway would loom upon them and through it they would drive into a garden and draw up at an open welcoming door with light streaming from it and those servants standing in it who according to the advertisement remained. Instead, the fly suddenly stopped. Peering out, they could see they were still in the village street and small dark houses each side and Beppo, throwing the reins over the horse's back as if completely confident this time that he would not go any farther, got down off his box. At the same moment, springing as it seemed out of nothing, a man and several half-grown boys appeared on each side of the fly and began dragging out the suitcases. Uh, no, no, uh, uh, San Salvatore, San Salvatore, explained Mrs. Wilkins, trying to hold on to what suitcases she could. Si, si, San Salvatore, San Salvatore, they all shouted, pulling. This can't be San Salvatore, said Mrs. Wilkins, turning to Mrs. Arbuthnot, who sat quite still watching her suitcases being taken from her with the same patience she applied to lesser evils. She knew she could do nothing if these men were wicked men determined to have their suitcases. I don't think it can be, she admitted, and could not refrain from a moment's wonder at the ways of God. Had she really been brought here, she and poor Mrs. Wilkins, after so much trouble in arranging it, so much difficulty and worry, along with devious paths of prevarication and deceit, only to be... She checked her thought and gently said to Mrs. Wilkins, while the ragged youths disappeared with the suitcases into the night, and the man with the lantern helped Beppo pull the rug off her, that they were both in God's hands. And for the first time on hearing this, Mrs. Wilkins was afraid. There was nothing for it but to get out. Useless to try to go on sitting in the fly, repeating San Salvatore. Every time they said it and their voices each time were fainter, Beppo and the other man merely echoed it in a series of loud shouts. If only they had learned Italian when they were little, if only they could have said, we wish to be driven to the door. <laughs> but they did not even know what door was in Italian. Such ignorance was not only contemptible, it was, they now saw, definitely dangerous. Useless, however, to put off whatever it was that was going to happen to them by trying to go on sitting in the fly, they therefore got out. The two men opened their umbrella for them and handed them to them. From this, they received a faint encouragement because they could not believe that these men were wicked they would pause to open umbrellas. The man with the lantern then made signs to them to follow him, talking loud and quickly, and Beppo, they noticed, remained behind. Ought they pay to him? Pay him? No, they thought. If they were going to be robbed and perhaps murdered, uh, surely on such an occasion one did not pay. Besides, we had not, after all, brought them to San Salvatore where they had got to, to was in, in evidently somewhere else. Also, he did not show the least wish to be paid. He let them go away into the night with no clamor at all. This, they could not help thinking, was a bad sign. 
he asked for nothing because presently he was to get so much. They came to some steps. The road abruptly, uh, the road ended abruptly in a church and some descending steps. The man held the lantern low for them to see the steps. San Salvatore? said Mrs. Wilkins once again, very faintly, being committed before committing herself to the steps. It was useless to mention it now, of course, but she could not go down steps in complete silence. No medieval castle, she was sure, was ever built at the bottom of steps. Again, however, came the echoing shout, Si, si, San Salvatore. They descended gingerly, holding up their skirts, just as if they would be wanting them another time and had not at all probability finished with skirts forever. The steps ended in a steeply sloping path with flat stone slabs down the middle. They slipped a good deal on these wet slabs and the man with the lantern talking loud and quickly held them up. His way of holding them up was polite. Perhaps, said Mrs. Wilkins in a low voice to Mrs. Arbuthnot, it is all right after all. We're in God's hands, said Mrs. Arbuthnot again, and again Mrs. Wilkins was afraid. They reached the bottom of the sloping path, and the light of the lantern flickered over an open space with houses round three sides. The sea was the fourth side lazily washing backwards and forwards on pebbles. San Salvatore, said the man, pointing with his lantern to a black mass curved round the water like an arm flung about it. They strained their eyes. They saw the black mass and on the top of it a light. San Salvatore, they repeated incredulously, for where were the suitcases? And why had they been forced to get out of the fly? Si, 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 San Salvatore. They went along what seemed to be a key, right on the edge of the water. There was not even a low wall here, nothing to prevent the man with the lantern tipping them in if he wanted to. He did not, however, tip them in. Perhaps it was all right after all. Mrs. Wilkins again suggested to Mrs. Arbuthnot on noticing this, who this time was herself beginning to think that it might be, and said no more about God's hands. The flicker of the lantern danced along, reflected in the wet pavement of the quay. Out to the left in the darkness and evidently at the end of a jetty was a red light. They came to an archway with a heavy iron gate. The man with the lantern pushed the gate open. This time they went upstairs instead of down, and at the top of them was a little path that round, round that wound upwards among flowers. They could not see the flowers, but the whole place was evidently full of them. It here dawned on Mrs. Wilkins that perhaps the reason why the fly had not driven them up to the door was that there was no road only a footpath. That would also explain the disappearance of the suitcases. She began to feel confident that they would find their suitcases waiting for them when they got up to the top. San Salvatore was, it seemed, on the top of a hill, as a medieval castle should be. At a turn of the path they saw above them, much nearer now and shining more brightly, the light they had seen from the key. She told Mrs. Arbuthnot of her dawning belief and Mrs. Arbuthnot agreed that it was very likely a true one. Once more, but this time in a tone of real hopefulness, Mrs. Wilkins said, pointing toward upwards at the black outline against the only slightly less black sky, San Salvatore? <laughs> and once more, but this time, com com comfortingly, encouragingly came back the assurance, si, si, San Salvatore. They crossed a little bridge over what was apparently a ravine and then came a flat bit with long grass at the sides and more flowers. They felt the grass flicking wet against their stockings 
and the invisible flowers were everywhere. Then up again through trees along a zigzag path with the smell all the way of flowers they could not see. The warm rain was bringing out all the sweetness. Higher and higher they went in this sweet darkness and the red light on the quay dropped farther and farther below them. The path wound round to the other side of what appeared to be a little peninsula. The jetty and the red light disappeared across the emptiness of their left where distance lights. Nezago, said the man, waving his lantern at the lights. CC, they answered, for they had by now learned CC. Upon which the man congratulated them in a great flow of polite words, not one of which they understood, on their magnificent Italian. For this was Domenico, the vigilant and accomplished gardener of San Salvatore, the prop and stay of the establishment, the resourceful, the gifted, the eloquent, the courteous, the intelligent Domenico. Only... They did not know that yet. And he did in the dark and even sometimes in the light look with his knife sharp swarthy figures and swift panther movements very much like somebody wicked. They passed along another flat bit of path with a black shape like a high wall towering above them on their right. And then the path went up again under trellises and trailing sprays of scented things caught at them and shook raindrops on them. And the light of the lantern flickered over lilies. And then came a flight of ancient steps worn with centuries. And then another iron gate. And then... They were inside, though still climbing a twisted flight of stone steps with old walls on either side, like the walls of dungeons and with a vaulted roof. At the top was a wrought iron door and through it shone a flood of electric light. Echo, said Domenico, lightly running up the last few steps ahead and pushing the door open. And there they were, arrived, and it was San Salvatore, and their suitcases were waiting for them, and they had not been murdered. They looked at each other's white faces and blinking eyes very solemnly. It was a great, wonderful moment. Here they were in their medieval castle at last, their feet touched its stones. Mrs. Wilkins put her arm around Mrs. Arbuthnot's neck and kissed her. The first thing to happen in this house, she said softly, solemnly, shall be a kiss. Dear Lottie, said Mrs. Arbuthnot. Dear Rose, said Mrs. Wilkins, her eyes brimming with gladness. Domenico was delighted. He liked to see beautiful ladies kiss. He made them a most appreciative speech of welcome, and they stood arm in arm, holding each other up, for they were very tired, blinking smilingly at him and not understanding a word. So we finally got them there. <laughs> now let's wake up the next morning and discover San Salvatore, chapter six. When Mrs. Wilkins woke next morning, she lay in bed a few minutes before getting up and opening the shutters. What would she see out of her window? A shining world or a world of rain? But it would be beautiful. Whatever it was would be beautiful. She was in a little bedroom with bare white walls and a stone floor and a sparse old furniture. The beds, there were two, were made of iron, enameled black, enameled black and painted with bunches of gay flowers. She lay putting off the great moment of going to the window as one puts off opening a precious letter, gloating over it. She had no idea what time it was she had forgotten to wind up her watch ever since, centuries ago, she last went to bed in London. No sounds were to be heard in the house, 
So she supposed it was very, very early, yet she felt as if she had slept a long while, so, so completely rested, so perfectly content. She lay with her arms clasped around her head, thinking how happy she was. Her lips curved upwards in a delighted grin. In bed by herself. Oh, adorable condition. She had not been in bed without Mellish once now for five whole years. And the cool roominess of it, the freedom of one's movements, the sense of recklessness, of audacity in giving the blankets a pull if one wanted to, or switching the pillows more comfortable. It was like the discovery of an entirely new joy. Mrs. Wilkins longed to get up and open the shutters, but where she was was really so very delicious. She gave a sigh of contentment and went on lying there, looking round her, taking in everything in her room, her own little room, her very own, to arrange just as she pleased for this one blessed month. Her room bought with her own savings, the fruit of her careful denials, whose door she could bolt if she wanted to, and nobody had the right to come in. It was such a strange little room, so different from any she had known, and so sweet. It was like a cell. Except for the two beds, it suggested a happy austerity. And the name of the chamber, she thought, quoting and smiling around at it, was peace. Well, this was delicious, to lie there thinking how happy she was. But outside those shutters, it was more delicious still. She jumped up, pulled on her slippers, and there was nothing on the stone floor but one small rug, ran to the window and threw open the shutters. Oh, cried Mrs. Wilkins. All the radiance of April in Italy lay gathered together at her feet. The sun poured in on her. The sea lay asleep in it, hardly stirring. Across the bay, the lovely mountains, exquisitely different in color, were asleep too in the light. And underneath her window, at the bottom of the flower-starred grass slope from which the wall of the castle rose up was a great cypress cutting through the delicate blues and violets and rose colors of the mountains and the sea like a great black sword. She stared, such beauty, and she there to see it. Such, uh, let me just, there we go. And she there to see it. Her face was bathed in light. Lovely scents came up to the window and caressed her. A tiny breeze gently lifted her hair. Far out in the bay, a cluster of almost motionless fishing boats hovered like a flock of white birds on the tranquil sea. How beautiful, how beautiful not to have died before this, to have been allowed to see, breathe, feel this. She stared, her lips parted. Happy, <laughs> poor, ordinary, everyday world. But what could one say? How could one describe it? It was as though she hardly stay inside herself. It was as though she were washed through with light. And how astonishing to feel this sheer bliss. For well, here she was, not doing or not going to do a single unselfish thing. <laughs> not going to do a thing she didn't want to do. According to everybody, she had come across, she ought at least to have twinges. She had not one twinge. Something was wrong somewhere. Wonderful that at home she should have been so good, so terribly good, 
and merely felt tormented. Twinges of every sort had been there, her portion, aches, hurts, discouragements, and she the whole time being steadily unselfish. Now she had taken off all her goodness and left it behind her like a heap of rain sodden clothes, and she only felt joy. She was naked of goodness and was rejoicing at being naked. She was stripped and exulting, and there away in the dim mugginess of Hampstead, London, was Mellish being angry. She tried to visualize Mellish. She tried to see him having breakfast and thinking bitter things about her. And lo, Mellish himself began to shimmer, became rose-colored, became delicate violet, became an enchanting blue, became formless, became iridescent. Actually, Mellish, after quivering a minute, was lost in sight. Well, thought Mrs. Wilkins, staring, as it were, after him, how extraordinary not to be able to visualize Mellish. And she, who used to know every feature, every expression of his by heart, she simply could not see him as he was. She could only see him resolved into beauty, melted into harmony with everything else. The familiar words of the general thanksgiving came quite naturally into her mind, and she found herself blessing God for her creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for his inestimable love. Out loud, in a burst of acknowledgement, while Mellish at that moment, angrily pulling on his boots before going out into the dripping streets, was indeed thinking bitter things about her. She began to dress, choosing clean white clothes in honor of the summer's day, unpacking her suitcases, tidying her adorable little room. She moved about with quick, purposeful steps, her long, thin body held up straight, her small face so much puckered at home with effort and fear, smoothed out. All she had been and done before this morning, all she had felt and worried about, was gone. Each of her worries behaved as the image of Mellersh had behaved and dissolved into color and light. And she noticed things she had not noticed for years. When she was doing her hair in front of the glass, she noticed it and thought, why, what pretty stuff. For years she had forgotten she had such a thing as hair, plating it in the evening and unplating it in the morning with the same hurry and indifference with which she laced and unlaced her shoes. Now she suddenly saw it and she twisted it around her fingers before the glass and was glad it was so pretty. Mellish couldn't have seen it either, for he had never said a word about it. Well, when she got home, she would draw his attention to it. Mellish, she would say, look at my hair. Aren't you pleased you've got a wife with hair like curly honey? She laughed. She had never said anything like that to Mellish yet, and the idea that amused her, but why had she not? Oh, yes, she used to be afraid of him. Funny to be afraid of anybody, and especially one's husband, whom one saw in his more simplified moments, such as sleep and not breathing properly through his nose. When she was ready, she opened her door to go across to see if Rose, who had been put the night before by a sleepy maid servant into a cell opposite, was awake. She would say good morning to her, and then she would run down and stay with that cypress tree till breakfast was ready. And after breakfast, she wouldn't so much as look out of a window till she had helped Rose get everything ready for Lady Caroline and Mrs. Fisher. There was much to be done that day, settling in, arranging the rooms. She mustn't leave Rose to do it alone. They would make it all so lovely for the two to come 
have such an entrancing vision ready for them of little cells bright with flowers. She remembered she had wanted Lady Caroline not to come, fancy wanting to shut someone out of heaven because she thought she would be shy of her, and as though it mattered if she were, and as though she would do anything so self-conscious as being shy. Besides, what a reason. She could not accuse herself of goodness over that. And she remembered not to have Mrs. Fisher either because she had seemed lofty. How funny of her. So funny to worry about such little things, making them important. The bedrooms and two of the sitting rooms at South Salvatore were on the top floor and opened into a roomy hall with a wide glass window at the north end. San Salvatore was rich in small gardens in different parts and on different levels. This, the garden this window looked down on was made on the highest part of the walls and could only be reached through the corresponding spacious hall on the floor below. When Mrs. Wilkins came out of her room, this window stood wide open and beyond it in the sun was a Judas tree in full flower. There was no sign of anybody, no voices or feet. Tubs of arum lilies stood about on the stone floor and on a table flamed a huge branch of fierce nasturtiums. Spacious, flowery, silent, with the wide window at the end opening into the garden and the Judas tree absolutely beautiful in the sunshine. It seemed to Mrs. Wilkins, arrested on her way across to Mrs. Arbuthnot, too good to be true. She was really going to live in this for a whole month? Up to now, she had had to take what beauty she could as she went along, snatching at little bits of it when she came across it. A patch of daisies on a fine day in a Hampstead field, a flash of sunset between two chimney pots. She had never been in definitely, completely beautiful place. She had never been even in a venerable house. And such a thing as a profusion of flowers in her rooms was unattainable to her. Sometimes in the spring, she had bought six tulips at Shoalbreds, unable to resist them, conscious that Mellish, if he knew what they had cost, would think it inexcusable, but they had soon died. And then there were no more. As for the Judas tree, she hadn't an idea what it was and gazed at it out there against the sky with the rapt expression of one who sees a heavenly vision. Mrs. Arbuthnot, coming out of her room, found her there like that, standing in the middle of hall, the hall, staring. Now, what does she think she sees now, thought Mrs. Arbuthnot. We are in God's hands, said Mrs. Wilkins, turning to her, speaking with extreme conviction. Oh, said Mrs. Arbuthnot quickly, her face, which had been covered with smiles when she came out of her room following. Why, what has happened? For Mrs. Arbuthnot had woken up with such a delightful feeling of security, of relief, and she did not want to find she did, that she had not, after all, escaped from the need of refuge. She had not even dreamed of Frederick. For the first time for years, she had been spared the nightly dream that he was with her, that they were heart to heart and its miserable awakening. She had slept like a baby and had woken up confident. She had found there was nothing she wished to say in her morning prayer except, thank you. It was disconcerting to behold she was, after all, in God's hands. I hope nothing has happened, she asked anxiously. Mrs. Wilkins looked at her a moment and laughed. How funny, she said, kissing her. What's funny, said Mrs. Albuth, not her face clearing because Mrs. Wilkins laughed. We are, this is everything. It is all so wonderful, it's so, funny and so adorable that we should be in it. I dare say when we finally reach heaven, 
the one they talk about so much, we shan't find it a bit more beautiful. Mrs. Arbuthnot relaxed to smiling security again. Isn't it divine, she said. Were you ever, ever in your life so happy, asked Mrs. Wilkins, catching her by the arm. No, said Mrs. Arbuthnot, nor had she been, not ever, not even in her first love days with Frederick, because always pain had been close at hand in their other happiness ready to torture with doubts, to torture even with the very excess of her love. While that was the simple happiness, complete harmony with her surroundings, the happiness that asks for nothing, that just accepts, just breathes, just is. Let's go and look at that tree close, said Mrs. Wilkins. I don't believe it can only be a tree. And arm in arm, they went along the hall, and their husbands would not even known them. Their faces were so young with eagerness. And together, they stood at the open window. And when their eyes, having feasted on the marvelous pink thing, wandered farther among the beauties of the garden, they saw sitting on the low wall at the east end of it, gazing out over the bay, her feet in lilies, Lady Caroline. They were astonished. They said nothing in their astonishment. They stood quite still, arm in arm, staring down at her. She too had on a white frock and her head was bare. They had had no idea that day in London when her hat was down to her nose and her furs were up to her ears that she was so pretty. They had merely thought her different from the other women in the club and so had the other women themselves, and so had all the waitresses, eyeing her sideways and eyeing her again as they passed the corner where she was sitting, and they had no idea she was so pretty. She was exceedingly pretty. Everything about her was very much that which it was. Her fair hair was very fair, her lovely gray eyes were very lovely and gray, her dark eyelashes were very dark, her white skin was very white. Her red mouth was very red. She was extravagantly slender, the merest thread of a girl, though not without little curves beneath her thin frock where little curves should be. She was looking out across the bay and was sharply defined against the background of empty blue. She was full in the sun. Her feet dangled among the leaves and flowers of the lilies, just as if it did not matter that they should be bent or bruised. She ought to have a headache, whispered Mrs. Arbuthnot, at last sitting there in the sun like that. She ought to have a hat, whispered Mrs. Wilkins. She's treading on lilies, but they're hers as much as ours, only one fourth of them. Lady Caroline turned her head. She looked up at them a moment, surprised to see them so much younger than they had seemed that day at the club in London and so much less unattractive. Indeed, they were really almost quite attractive, if anyone could ever be really quite attractive in the wrong clothes. Her eyes, swiftly glancing over them, took in every inch of them in the half second before she smiled and waved her hand and called out, Good morning. There was nothing she saw at once to be hoped for in the way of interest from their clothes. She did not consciously think this, for she was having a violent reaction against beautiful clothes and the slavery they impose on one. Her experience being that the instant one had got them, they took one in hand and gave one no peace till they had been everywhere and been seen by everybody. You didn't like your clothes, to, you didn't take your clothes to parties, they took you. It was quite a mistake to think that a woman, a really well-dressed woman, wore out her clothes. It was the clothes that wore out the woman, dragging her about at all hours of the day and night. No wonder men stayed younger, longer, just new trousers couldn't excite them. 
She couldn't suppose that even the newest trousers ever behaved like that, taking the bit between their teeth. Her images were disorderly, but she thought as she chose, she used what images she liked. As she got off the wall and came towards the window, it seemed a restful thing to know she was going to spend an entire month with people in dresses made as she dimly remembered dresses used to be made five summers ago. I got here yesterday morning, she said, looking up at them and smiling. She really was bewitching. She had everything, even a dimple. It's a great pity, said Mrs. Arbuthnot, smiling back, because we were going to choose the nicest room for you. Oh, I've done that, Lady Caroline said. At least I think it's the nicest. It looks two ways. I adore a room that looks two ways, don't you? over the sea to the west and over this Judas tree to the north. And we had meant to make it pretty for you with flowers, said Mrs. Wilkins. Oh, Domenico did that. I told him to, to directly as soon as I got there. He's the gardener, he's wonderful. Oh, it's a good thing, of course, said Mrs. Arbuthnot, a little hesitantly to be independent and to know exactly what one wants. Yes, it saves trouble, agreed Lady Caroline. But one shouldn't be so independent, said Mrs. Wilkins, as to leave no opportunity for other people to exercise their benevolences on one. Lady Caroline, who had been looking at Mrs. Arbuthnot, now looked at Mrs. Wilkins. That day at that queer club, she had had merely a blurred impression of Mrs. Wilkins, for it was the other one who did all the talking. And her impression had been of somebody so shy, so awkward, that it was best to take no notice at all. She had not even been able to say goodbye properly, go, uh, doing it in, in on an agony, turning red, turning damp. Therefore, she now looked at her in some surprise, and she was still more surprised when Mrs. Wilkins added, gazing at her with the most obvious sincere admiration, speaking indeed with a conviction that refused to remain unuttered, I didn't realize you were so pretty. She stared at Mrs. Wilkins. She was not usually told this quite so immediately and roundly. Abundantly, as she was used to it, impossible not to be after 28 solid years, it surprised her to be told it with such bluntness <laughs> and by a woman. It's very kind of you to think so, she said. Why, you're lovely, said Mrs. Wilkins. Quite, quite lovely. I hope, said Mrs. Arbuthnot pleasantly, you make the most of it. Lady Caroline then stared at Mrs. Arbuthnot. Oh, yes, she said, I make the most of it. I've been doing that ever since I can remember. Because, said Mrs. Arbuthnot, smiling and raising a warning forefinger, it won't last. Then Lady Caroline began to be afraid these two were originals. If so, she would be bored. Nothing bored her so much as people who insisted on being original, who came and buttonholed her and kept her waiting while they were being original. And the one who admired her, it would be tiresome if she dogged her about in order to look at her. What she wanted of this holiday was complete escape from all she had had before. She wanted the best of complete contrast. Being admired, being dogged, wasn't contrast, it was repetition. And it was for originals to find herself shut up with two on top of a precipitous hill in a medieval castle built for the express purpose of preventing easy goings out and in would not, she was afraid, be especially restful. Perhaps she had better be a little less encouraging. She, uh, they had se seemed such timid creatures, even the dark one, she couldn't remember their names. The day at the club that she had felt it quite safe to be friendly. Here, they had come out of their shells already, indeed, at once. There was no sign of timidity about either of them there. If they had got out of their shell so immediately at the very first contact, 
unless she checked them, they would soon begin to press upon her and then goodbye to her dream of 30 restful silent days lying unmolested in the sun, getting her feathers smoothed again, not being spoken to, not waited on, not grabbed at and monopolized, but just recovering from the fatigue, the deep and melancholy fatigue of the too much. Besides, there was Mrs. Fisher. She too must be checked. Lady Caroline had started two days earlier than had been arranged for two reasons. First, because she wished to arrive before the others in order to pick out the room or room she preferred. And second, because she judged it likely that otherwise she would have to travel with Mrs. Fisher. She did not want to travel with Mrs. Fisher. She did not want to arrive with Mrs. Fisher. She saw no reason whatever why for a single moment she should have anything to do at all with Mrs. Fisher. But unfortunately, Mrs. Fisher was also filled with the desire to get to San Salvatore first and pick out the room or room she preferred. And she and Lady Caroline had after all traveled together. As early as Calais, they began to suspect it. In Paris, they feared it. At Modain, they knew it. At Mezago, they concealed it, driving out to Castagnato in two separate flies, the nose of the one almost touching the back of the other the whole way. But when the road suddenly left off at the church and the steps, further evasion was impossible. And faced by this abrupt and difficult finish to their journey, there was nothing for it but to amalgamate. Because of Mrs. Fisher's stick, Lady Caroline had to see about everything. Mrs. Fisher's intentions, she explained from her fly when the situation had become plain to her, were active, but her stick prevented their being carried out. The two drivers told Kate, Ka Lady Caroline boys they would have to carry the luggage up to the castle and she went in search of some while Mrs. Fisher waited in the fly because of her stick. Mrs. Fisher could speak Italian, but only she explained the Italian of Dante, which Matthew Arnold used to read with her when she was a girl. And she thought this might be above the heads of boys. Therefore, Lady Caroline, who spoke ordinary Italian very well, was obviously the one to go and do things. I'm in your hands, said Mrs. Fisher, sitting firmly in her fly. You must please regard me as merely an old woman with a stick. And presently down the steps and cobbles to the piazza and along the quay and up the zigzag path, Lady Caroline found herself as much obliged to walk slowly with Mrs. Fisher as if she were her own grandmother. It's my stick, Mrs. Fisher complacently remarked at intervals. And when they rested at those bends of the zigzag path where seats were and Lady Caroline, who would have liked to run on and get to the top quickly, was forced in common humanity to remain with Mrs. Fisher because of her stick, Mrs. Fisher told her how she had been on a zigzag path once with Tennyson. Isn't this, his cricket wonderful, said Lady Caroline absently. The Tennyson, said Mrs. Fisher, turning her head and observing her a moment over her spectacles. Isn't he, said Lady Caroline. I am speaking, said Mrs. Fisher, of Alfred. Oh, said Lady Caroline, and it was a path too. Mrs. Fisher went on severely, curiously like this. No eucalyptus trees, of course, but otherwise curiously like this. And at one of the bends, he turned and said to me, I see him now turning and saying to me, yes, Mrs. Fisher would have to be checked. And so would these two up at the window. She had better begin at once. She was sorry she had got off the wall. All she need have done was to have waved her hand and waited till they came down and out into the garden to her. So she ignored Mrs. 
Abu thought, Abu Thnot's remark and raised forefinger and said with marked coldness, at least she tried to make it sound marked, that she supposed they would be going to breakfast and that she had had hers, but it was her fate that however coldly she sent forth her words, they came out sounding quite warm and agreeable. That was because she had a sympathetic and delightful voice due entirely to some special formation of her throat and the roof of her mouth and having nothing whatever to do with what she was feeling. Nobody in consequence ever believed they were being snubbed. It was most tiresome. And if she stared icily, it did not look icy at all because her eyes, lovely to begin with, had the added loveliness of very long, soft, dark eyelashes. No icy stare could come out of her eyes like that. It got caught and lost in the soft eyelashes and the person stared at merely thought they were being regarded with a flattering and exquisite attentiveness. And if ever she was out of humor or definitely cross, and who would not be sometimes in such a world, she only looked so pathetic that people all rushed to comfort her, if possible by means of kissing, it was more than tiresome. It was maddening. Nature was determined that she should look and sound angelic. She could never be disagreeable or rude without being completely misunderstood. I had breakfast in my room, she said, trying her utmost to sound curt. Perhaps I'll see you later. And she nodded and went back to where she had been sitting on the wall with the lilies being nice and cool around her feet. <laughs> Thus we have the four ladies and off we go. <laughs> Such a great book and so funny. And you can see these people. I think that uh, Miss Von Arnim draws pictures of these women so, so clearly. And uh, I shan't spoil it for you, but when the men start arriving, she does the same thing with the men. The men were not planned to arrive, obviously, but I shan't tell you what happens. But uh, the book is great. The film is great. Joan Plowright, as you can see, you can hear her, uh, is absolutely brilliant for that part. So thus, The Enchanted April, a special request from Julia Pierce, our producer, who is also having her birthday today. So there we are, enchantment in Enchanted April. Happy birthday, Julia. Well, next week, what shall we do next week? Next week, we are going to celebrate uh, Maritime Month, uh, which is being celebrated at the library. And living as we do here in Midcoast, Maine on the ocean, there are only 5,623,000 books that would have a maritime theme to them. I've always been fond of Herman Melville, and I've always been fond of his last story, which was published posthumously, um, uh, not finished, actually. Uh, attempts were made to finish it by his wife and then his publisher and then finally his most recent publisher. Uh, the book uh, is called, uh, the, the short book, short story really, is called Billy Budd, Sailor. Uh, Billy Budd has also inspired a, a great stage play and also a smashing opera. Um, and I'll just read a couple of things for you here. Uh, and the book jacket, of course, it's always glorious words on the back of the book jacket here, but uh, he does call it one of Malvel's supreme masterpieces. And in the introduction inside, in December, 1885, having inherited some money, Melville at last felt able to retire. After 20 years nearly as an outdoor custom house officer, he wrote in 1889, I have laterally come into possession of unobstructed leisure, but only just as in the course of nature, my vigor sensibly declines. What little of it is left I husband for certain matters and yet incomplete and which indeed may never be completed, quote unquote, that work never to be completed was Billy Budd. 
So that's what we shall do week, next week and the following week, we shall celebrate Hemingway month. Obviously, some of you might have been watching the recent uh, three-part uh, series of Ken Burns uh, on Hemingway. Um, and we are going to read uh, Hemingway's last book, although it celebrates his wild times in Paris in the 20s. Uh, but it was the last book that he wrote before he um, went on to the party in the sky. So we have a big month ahead of us, two brilliant books, two brilliant authors. Uh, and then we shall head into May with a bunch of new stories for you. Please take time, if you have the time, to send us an email with some suggestions you might have for us. Uh, the email address is very, very simple. It is um, Friday Explorations, Friday Dash explorations with an s at usa.net friday explorations usa.net please uh, do send us a suggestion or two or correct me dogged i said and i think it should be dogged so i do want to make one repair so i might avoid one email <laughs> thank you so much for being with me today it was such a delightful book to read uh even though i'd read it a couple of times already and i hope you enjoyed it uh here as uh, the enchanting month of april as we head into summer um, enjoy the week ahead stay well stay healthy uh stay happy and above all of course stay safe it's not over yet thank you so much goodbye <laughs>